The playoff race is vulnerable. Sabres and Stars on Thursday night. You're locked on Sabres, your daily podcast on the Buffalo Sabres. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Thanks for making Locked On Sabres your first listen every day. We are free and available wherever you get your podcast and on YouTube, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Sneaky Joe DiBiase at Sneaky Joe Sports on Twitter, at Locked On Sabres on Twitter, or again, you can check out our YouTube channel by searching us on YouTube. We've got a, a game to preview Thursday night against the Dallas Stars to talk about. It's a big one. Uh, as every game going forward will be. But this one in particular, I'll explain a little bit later on. There's a big game outside of Buffalo, uh, out of town scoreboard that's going to be big. And we've got uh, some other stuff to talk about, including sneaky good bets, uh, break down the hunt a little bit, and we'll uh, we'll do it all here on the Lockdown Sabres podcast. But a little bit of a recap of the Sabres' most recent loss to the New York Islanders at the start here. Not too long. Fans, I don't want to move on past it. Wasn't a great night. Uh, not a good game to think about, but just to get my takes in on it real quick, uh, I did think the Sabres were thoroughly outplayed, right? Second and third period. Part of that, of course, could have been that they were playing the second of a back-to-back. The Islanders had been on five days rest, and I think that, of course, contributed to the energy difference uh, in the game because the Islanders thoroughly dominated the Sabres in that game, especially in the second and the third period. And if anything, Monday and Tuesday got to be disappointing because the one thing that has held the Sabres back all season is goaltending. And they got two pretty good games in a row out of their goaltenders. Eric Comrie only allowing three goals to the Oilers and then Uka Pekka only allowing three goals uh, on Tuesday to the Islanders, making some big saves. They were outshot by a lot. Um, it was a frustrating game because even though the Sabres should have lost the game, a couple of goal posts, uh, for the Islanders, Bo Horvat hit a post as hard as you could imagine a couple of minutes before their game winning goal. There's Hudson fashing former Sabre of all people, a guy who, by the way, remember he scored his first NHL game for the Sabres big moment, big prospect. Oh, everybody loved him. He scored his first game and then didn't score again for like seven years. This season is the first time he has scored since that game, that number one uh, game of his career. So, fashing, and it was a kick. Let's all be real. It was a kick. The NHL just doesn't know what a kick is. And they're very, I think they purposely don't define what a kicking motion is in their rule book in order to leave ambiguity so that in the moment they can decide whatever they want. Because a kick deliberately, you know, putting it into the back of the net with your, with your skate slash leg. Cause a kick, by the way, you could kick your leg and it hits the, the, the puck hits your leg on the knee and it's still a kick. It's a kicking motion. This was a kicking motion. There's a screenshot where you can look at fashing's leg behind him. And then the next screenshot is him following through with his leg forward. Now he has not moved otherwise, but his leg goes from back to front back to front that is a motion when you move your leg back to front it's a kick that is literally what a kick is nhl doesn't know what a kick is terrible rule it's not properly defined you know what just allow all kicking goals if it's you know what you want to increase scoring as much as possible i think the reason why gary bettman has even said this before they don't want players swinging their skates around goaltenders. I get that player safety. I can get on board with that, but the way they have it set up now, it's so bad. It's so bad. And that goal should not have counted, especially when the call on the ice was that when the call on the ice was that it's a goal or that it was, it was no goal, that it was a kick. And I personally hate the clear and obvious type of ruling that you see in the NFL and the NHL where, hey, if it's close at all, we'll go with the call on the ice. No, no, I would say just go with whatever you think the what it is on the video. Don't even worry about what you called. But that's not how it's set up. It is set up so that the call on the ice is supposed to matter. And they ignored that too. 
That I just I, I can't believe that it actually happened. Uh, Goathead of the night in this one has to go to Dylan Cousins. Dylan Cousins could have had four goals on this game, and um, and same thing with Monday. I thought Dylan Cousins was really strong in both games. Uh, controlled play transitionally. He made a couple of poor plays defensively. I will say that. In fact, he left fashing on his own um, for that game-winning goal. But his responsibility maybe been a little bit further up the ice. I'd go with Cousins for uh, Goathead of the night. When we come back, we'll preview Sabres and Stars, and we'll let you give you an update about where the Islanders sit in the standings. A big game they have on Thursday night, but kind of a complication as to who you should root for. So that's ahead here on the Locked on Sabres podcast. We are brought to you by FanDuel Sportsbook. When we go to our sneaky good bets of the night a little bit later on, the odds we get and where we'll bet those are at FanDuel Sportsbook. It's the midway point. That's the midway point of the NBA season. We're in the home stretch of the NHL uh, regular season. It's a perfect time to download FanDuel, America's number one sportsbook. College basketball, of course. We got conference championship going on. We got the tournament coming up in just a couple of weeks. New customers get a no sweat first bet up to $1,000. That is bonus bets back if your first bet doesn't win. Just to download the FanDuel Sportsbook app. It's safe, secure, and super easy to use. Then you can bet on everything from the money line to point scores and threes drain. Plus, FanDuel even lets you combine your bets for a chance at a bigger payout with a same-game parlay. So don't miss the chance to get your no-sweat first bet up to $1,000 in bonus bets back when you go to FanDuel Sportsbook, FanDuel.com slash locked on. It's FanDuel.com slash locked on to learn more. Make every moment more with FanDuel, an official sports betting partner of the NBA. Sneaky Joe DiBiase back here on the Locked On Sabres podcast. Sabres versus Stars at home. The Sabres need to get a win at home. 13 wins the entire season. In fact, their home record, 13-17-2. So 13 wins, 19 losses. That is the fourth worst record at home in the National Hockey League. Only Columbus, Anaheim, and San Jose are worse. They are worse at home than Chicago, than Vancouver then Philadelphia, then Montreal. Some bad, bad, bad teams that the Sabres are behind in home record. But they do win when they're wearing red and black. Hey, blue and gold at home, they have five wins on the season. That's what's pretty That's what's pretty abysmal. I like the Sabres tonight. And I'll get to that in Seeky Good Bets in a little bit. Or I guess, actually, I, I, I won't. I, I do like the Sabres. I have another bet that I like, actually, for Sabres and Stars. But I do think it's huge to get Matias Samuelson and Riley Stillman back in the lineup. And that is happening. Don Granato confirmed it at the morning skate. The pairings, um, Bryson and Clegg come out and Stillman and Samuelson go in. Samuelson goes right back in with Rasmus Dahlin on the top pair. Stillman goes with Labushkin on the third pair. Yoki Haru and Power re- reunite uh, on the second pair. That is the Sabres blue line when it is at its best. They have puck movers in the top four, like Darlene and Power. They have uh, they have no nonsense, strong defensive defensemen like Samuelson, and I think Stillman helps the penalty kill in a big way. And I think that is part of the plan as to why he's here in the first place. So Stillman on the third pair, but the penalty kill is big, and Samuelson being on that top pair with Darlene. Uh, just to listen, Jacob Bryson, fun little player. I've always kind of liked Bryson, but seventh defenseman at best is probably what you want him for. And he was playing on the top pair with Rasmus Dahlin in the last two games. You cannot get to a point where that's happening, where, where Bryson's on your top pair. So, good news on the blue line. Interesting news up front. Jordan Greenway, only in his third game for the Sabres, is going to play on the top line with Tage Thompson and Jeff Skinner. And here's why it's an interesting idea that I'm, I'm, I like to see the Granado is testing it. I wonder how long he'll go with it. Jack Quinn, more than anyone on the Sabres roster, best replaces what Alex Tuck does with the puck. With the puck, Alex Tuck is fast. He's got a great shot. He's got good vision and a a great ability to pass. He's a great transition player as well. With the puck, nobody else replaces that finishing ability the playmaking ability, the stick handling, the skating, the speed. Nobody replaces that better than Jack Quinn. Jack Quinn does it best. But what Jack Quinn doesn't do as well is replace what Alex Tuck does without the puck. 
Talk on that line with Thompson and Skinner. He does so much because even though he makes these gorgeous plays, you know, g- give and goes, passes uh, back into the slot to set up Thompson, shots where he's roaring in and scoring, a lot of the value that Tuck provides to that line is what he does away from the puck. The pressure that Tuck supplies as a four checker. I've tweeted before, I think he's the best four checker in hockey. Maybe even above McDavid. McDavid doesn't do it as much because he's a center. Tuck is super fast, a very good skater. He can cut side to side on his edges. He's got a long stick. He's six foot four, and he's got that long stick, that long reach. He is going to bother you. So with the speed and the reach, that combination. And the physicality, too, because of his body type. He is one of the best four checkers, at least in hockey. And he forces a lot of turnovers in the offensive zone or defenseman's defensive zones. But what he also can do is pressure those defensemen enough so that when they're making passes through in transition to the neutral zone, they're off the mark because they're under duress. It's almost like a quarterback uh, in football where, you know what? It tucks the pass rusher. And even though he's not getting sacks, and not forcing turnovers in in the offensive zone, he's affecting the quarterback by pressuring them, and they're going to be less accurate when they're throwing the ball down the field. That's basically Tuck. He's a pass rusher in the offensive zone. The Von Miller of the Sabres, if I will. And Quinn, Quinn's not bad at it. He's not. But he's not as good as Tuck. He doesn't affect defensemen the same way that Tuck does. So, with Thompson being so good with the puck and Skinner being so good with the puck. Those are the guys you want to have it with it, right? When, when Tuck's not out there, can't I, do I need Quinn's puck skills out there? It helps. It's nice. It works. But maybe what I need on that top line is the stuff that happens away from the puck. And that's insert Jordan Greenway into that conversation. And I don't know a ton about Greenway's a specific skill as a four checker yet, but on paper, he does appear to be a player that can at best, you know, replace what tuck does as a player away from the puck, allow Thompson and Skinner to do all that. He's got good speed. He's got good edge work. He's very physical. He's got that long reach. Cause he's a big body and he's tall six foot six. And maybe he can affect defensemen in the same way that, Tuck would. And no, he is not going to play off Thompson and Skinner the same way he did. He's not going to join the, he's not going to jump down on the rush with these crazy highlight reel plays. You know, he could do the garbage stuff, right? Clean stuff up in front of the net, the corners, maybe a couple of deflections. He makes good passes. I've talked about his playmaking uh, already. The finishing ability, I don't think is near the same level, but I think the value of putting Greenway up there is so that Thompson doesn't have to four check. Skinner doesn't have to forecheck. Those guys don't have to be using as much energy defensively. Greenway can do that. I think Greenway might be a better fit than Quinn. And you know what? This this is how Don Granado can operate. Try it for a period. If it doesn't work, throw Quinn right back up there. The other thing Greenway on the top line does for the lineup, it creates a line of Dylan Cousins, Casey Middlestad, and Jack Quinn. And I love that line. I love it. I think I've told you last episode, I think Cousins and Middlestad have been playing great together. They feed off each other with speed. They are both great playmakers. They have great vision and and they have an awareness for spacing. The thing is, though, Vinny Hinostroza comes out. Now, he's going to be the healthy scratch. Hinostroza has been very good playing with those two. In fact, he scored two goals. He's had a lot of chances. But Vinny Hinostroza, at his core, is a bottom six winger that you can't expect to score more than about 10 to 15 goals. Jack Quinn has an elite finishing ability. Maybe it's not as consistent yet, but he tra- he's tracking towards being a 30-plus goal scorer in the NHL. His skill set fits for Cousins and Middlestat better than Hinnestroza did. So I think what Don Granato has done here is actually really smart, and again, the downside is you just you just take it out and you go back to what you had. But I think Quinn fits better on the Cousins middle stat line. He'll capitalize on more of the chances those two are creating than Henestroza will. And I think Greenway 
make creates more space for Thompson and Skinner, more opportunities by creating turnovers and can do a lot of the dirty work that Tuck honestly was doing before he got injured. So I like these line combinations. The other lines in the bottom six, Jost, Gergensen's Oposo, right back together. Always like that line as a, as a defensive checking line. The other line that has been put together that I'm not, I mean, on paper, it kind of looks nice, but I don't really believe in the, the, the execution of is Peyton Krebs centering Victor Olofsson and JJ Paterka. I like Krebs. I've liked him a lot this year, even when he's not putting up points. Olofsson though has been kind of an anchor the past 10 to 15 games at the very least. And Paterka he's played better as of late, but he has been very inconsistent at the, at, to be nice about it. And you have no idea really. I think what you're going to get from him game to game. So you know, and again, on paper, it looks like a line that should work. Krebs and Paterka playing off each other. Lots of speed. Um, they're very good playmakers. Olsen as the finisher on the line. On paper, it feels like that line should work. But I think the more likely outcome is though that line is going to disappear. But the top six, I like a lot. Uh, and I think it helps. And the defense, the defense group being what it is, I think the lineup for Thursday night's game is really strong. Dallas, by the way, uh, nothing really new about them since the last time we talked about them. Jason Robertson, still one of the best players in the league. Um, goal scoring, he's having a phenomenal season. He is at 38 goals in 64 games, already at 80 points. Tage Thompson, uh, like production. Rupe Hintz, a big year. 30 goals scored for him. Jamie Benn, you know, kind of kicking it back into gear at 33 years old. Isn't it kind of crazy Jamie Benn is only 33? Feels like he should be 37. Uh, he's got 26 goals on the season. And Miro Heiskanen, the number one defenseman, averaging almost 26 minutes a night. He's at 47 points on the year. Jake Ottinger will be between the pipes for Dallas. That's tough. It's a tough matchup. He's one of the best goalies in hockey. A 921 safe percentage on the season. Don't think he'll sneak his way into he might sneak his way actually into uh into Vesna cat candidacy. Um We'll see. He's not going to win it. It's going to be all mark goals saved above expected on the season. Where does Ottinger rank? Ottinger ranks. You know what? Little surprising. 21st out of a, out of a potential 74. So he's still well above average, but 21st in the league in the, uh, in goal saved above expected. So not quite as good as, uh, as I might've thought. And if I didn't mention it before, Eric Comrie between the pipes uh, for the Sabres. He's riding a four-game win streak, and I'm sure the hope from Don Granado is he will keep that momentum going, at least in terms of the team success. When we come back, an update on the hunt, who you should be rooting for on Thursday night, and it's not as easy as you might think. Sneaky Good Bets is on the way as well. Ahead here on the Locked on Sabres podcast, brought to you by Built Bar. Looking for a delicious treat? Don't want all the fat and calories. You got to try a built bar. We got through the holidays, we got through most of the winter. And I know my goal is to eat a little healthier this year as the weather is starting to get nicer. Uh, and you're going to be wearing, you know, the short sleeve shirts, the tank tops. Uh, no more hoodies are going away in a little bit. You got to try built with built. Healthy is actually tasty. Seriously, they are so delicious. You won't think they're good for you. Perfect for your new year's resolution. What makes built bars so good for starters, all covered in hundred percent real chocolate, real chocolate. Unbelievable flavors like churro, peanut butter brownie, coconut almond, and more. And for years, we've been telling you about ordering your Built Bars at Built.com. But now, get them at your local Walmart or Sam's Club. That's right. Head to your nearest Walmart today. Head to the pharmacy section and grab yourself a box of Built Bars. You can pick up a four-bar box of cookies and cream, double chocolate, or coconut puffs. And if you're close to a Sam's Club, run in and grab a 13-bar box with their hit flavors, brownie batter, and churro. You can thank me later. So, again, check them out at Walmart, Sam's Club, or at Built.com. Final segment, Joe DiBiase and the Lockdown Sabres podcast. The hunt. Little update. Not looking great. Five points back. The Sabres are five points back of a playoff spot that is currently occupied by the Pittsburgh Penguins. Uh, the New York Islanders are six points ahead of the Sabres uh, with – three games more played. So by points percentage, the Islanders are still the easier team to track down. Now, Ottawa is ahead of them. Florida is ahead of them as well, which has the Sabres in sixth place in the division, which I believe, if I'm remembering correctly, that's one spot lower than they were last year in the Atlantic division. So not good on that front. But 
You can get, you track them down tonight. Uh, you can get, you know, you can get closer to the Islanders, but here's what you need. Islanders and Penguins, a seven o'clock puck drop route for the Penguins. The Penguins are in a spot too. I know, but the Islanders are the team to track here because of the games that they've played in comparison to the Sabres. you got to make up the games in hand. Plus, you have one head-to-head matchup remaining with the Islanders. You have none left with Pittsburgh. So the opportunity is there to catch New York more so than it is with Pittsburgh, which means you root for a Penguins win in regulation. Uh, other than that, you have a night game, 10 o'clock puck drop in Seattle, Ottawa, as at the Kraken. Uh, a big game in the standings as well. Ottawa is trying to track down the Penguins. They're tied to the Sabres in the standings. So rooting against the Senators, that one's easy. You're rooting for the Kraken, but I do believe you're rooting for the Penguins uh, if you want the best thing for Buffalo. And other than that, New Jersey at Washington. Washington's behind you. You're rooting for New Jersey there. So that one's pretty easy. All right, it is time for Sneaky Good Bets, one of my favorite segments uh, of the week. And last game didn't go so hot, but we were on a hot streak before that. So we got to get, got to build that momentum back up uh, heading into the Dallas game on Thursday night. So here are my sneaky good bets of the night, starting with number one. I'm actually going to bet against the Sabres. I'm going to go Stars puck line at plus 158. You, those of you that aren't big betters, that would be betting 100 to win 158. Here's why I'm going with the Stars. A lot of the money is actually on is actually on Dallas in this one. But a high percentage of the bets are on the Sabres, which means the Sharps are on Dallas in this one. And it really, to me, comes down to goaltending. I love the Sabres lineup in this game. I've talked about their, their top six and their blue line. But I just don't trust Eric Comrie. And I do trust Jake Ottinger. He's one of the best goalies in hockey. Comrie this year has been one of the worst goalies in hockey. And I don't have confidence the Sabres are going to make that up. Of course, with the puck line, you got to the Stars would have to win by more than a goal and a half. But you could always get that empty netter plus the plus odds. I'm going Stars on the puck line as bet number one. Bet number two at minus one ten. So you'd have to bet one ten to win a hundred. Sabres, Stars, over six and a half goals. I'm going with the over in this game. I think Comrie's going to give up a bunch. I think Ottinger's going to hold the Sabres in check, but I could very easily see a, a five to two game here, uh, a four to three game. I uh, uh, Honestly, for the talent that these two have, if Ottinger has an off night, we could have a six to five game very easily. Dallas is a very talented team up front. In fact, they are... Third in the Western Conference in goals. Fourth in the Western Conference with goals. With 215. Um, That compares to the Sabres. The Sabres are at 233. So they're not that far off. Um, Really by conference. Shouldn't be that by conference. Shouldn't be that by goals scored in the league. Um, Dallas, in terms of the league, they're 10th. Uh, so yeah, they're still one of the higher scoring league teams in the league. Jason Robertson, uh, a lethal power play. I'm going with the over six and a half goals, which by the way, has come down Tuesday night. Uh, it was at seven and now it's at six and a half. And then my third and final bet of the night, Jake Ottinger over 27 and a half saves at minus 112. I think the Sabres are going to come out energized in this game. I think they're going to have a lot of chances. I think their top six is going to generate a lot of chances, but I think Ottinger is going to stand tall, even if it means only allowing the Sabres to score three or four. I can see the Sabres very easily getting to around 40 shots on goal in this game, and I think Ottinger is going to turn away at least 27 uh, and a half of them to get 28 saves in the game. That's my bet number three of the night. So I got Stars puck line, Saber Stars over six and a half goals, and Ottinger over 27 and a half saves. So those are my sneaky good bets of the night uh, for the Thursday night matchup against the Dallas Stars. All right. That's it for me here on the Lockdown Sabres podcast. Enjoy the game against the Stars. We'll recap it for you next time, and we'll look ahead to the weekend, a big weekend, tough opponents for the Sabres coming up. That's next here on the Locked On Sabres podcast with Joe DiBiase. Thanks for making us your first listen every day. Now, go make your next listen Locked On Game to Game. Every moment, every top performance, every result, Locked On Game to Game covers every game from across the NHL with local analysis that only Locked On can deliver. Follow Game to Game on Locked On NHL, available on the Odyssey app, YouTube, and wherever you get your podcasts.